Hello and welcome to this lesson on working with measurements with me, Mr McIver, here at the London Central and Northwest Maths Hub. This is part of the estimation topic. I want to start by going back to the Olympic Games in Rome in the year 1960, when electronic timing technology wasn't quite so advanced as it is now. And I want to look at one very particular race. It was held at the Aquatic Centre in Rome, and it was the men's 100 metres freestyle final. Here we go! Put the water together! 100 metres freestyle for men! A little hard to tell who's ahead there. Lane number one might be Robert Pound of Canada who leads. Now they're practically equal, it's going to be extremely close. Some of you are probably mesmerised by the appalling quality of the video. That's just how TV was in 1960, but that's not the point of the clip. I want you to watch and see what happens at the end of the race. Looks like Kevin or Ben Park is going to be extremely close. Nobody can tell who the winner is. There they go! I don't know if you caught the commentator saying nobody can tell who won there nor could the judges. Here was the problem. In 1960, there were three timekeepers at the end of each lane, measuring the time with a stopwatch for each swimmer. The three stopwatches measuring Devitt were agreed, but the three stopwatches recording Larson were slightly different. This is the kind of stopwatch the timekeepers at the 1960 Olympics would have used. Pretty smart looking, and here are the times they recorded. On the face of it, Larson clearly won. All his recorded times were lower than any of Devitt's recorded times. But the fact they didn't all agree for Larson raised the problem of what was his actual race time. Now, in order to answer that question, you have to bear in mind some very important errors that inevitably arise in this kind of situation. First of all, human error. Human reactions take time. They're fast, but they do take time between 0.15 and 0.3 seconds, according to the Scientific American, which means if they reacted at the instant they saw the racer end his length, they would actually have recorded a time between 0.15 and 0.3 seconds after the actual finish time. Second, and perhaps more significantly, there is an inbuilt problem with mechanical timers. They are susceptible to changes in temperature and humidity. And according to the British Journal of Sports Medicine, this error can be anything up to 0.2 seconds. Let's see what happens when you incorporate these errors into these apparently definitive race times. So there are Devitt and Larson's times, and there is a time scale from 54.5 up to 55.5 seconds. Now, according to these times, Devitt finished in 55.2 seconds. All three timekeepers agreed. But remember, they were reacting to seeing Devitt touching the end of the pool. And their reactions took place in a finite amount of time, which could have been different for each timer. Which means Devitt's true time was somewhere between 54.9 and 55.05 seconds. Similarly, for Larson, his times appear to be fairly consistent, although not identical. But the true times were, in fact, across a range which overlaps with Debit's time. Oh dear. And the situation becomes even less clear when you look at the error in the timer itself. Once again, here are Debit's times, and this time you need to remember that the timer error can be plus or minus 0.2 seconds. So in fact, we have to draw an interval around those times of 0.2 seconds each way. Similarly, for Larson, we have to draw intervals of 0.2 seconds each way. And oh my goodness, look at this huge overlap. Although it looks like Larson has finished in less time, there's quite a big range of possibilities in here that actually puts Devitt ahead. The first big idea you need to take away from this session is that any measurement you take, however exact you might think it is, is in fact a point estimate for a true measure, and all we can ever say about the true measure is it lies in some interval. 
And the situation is even worse than that, because these two different errors for reaction time and mechanical errors compound. They add together. So although debit could have taken as long as 55.4, according to the timer, the true time was at least 0.15 seconds earlier and could be up to 0.03 seconds earlier. So in fact, the true possible range of debit's times is this line here, 0.15 seconds back from the slowest and 0.3 seconds back from the quickest. And if we make those corrections for Larson and Devitt, we get a huge overlap of times. And that's why the dispute over who won that race went on for months. You might be interested to know that the judges awarded the race to Devitt against the popular view at the time. But this is a maths lesson, not one of Olympic history. Read up on it yourself if you want. The important thing I want you to remember from this is no measurement is ever exact. Let's look at a typical British second-class stamp. It's pretty obvious this measurement is approximate if I measure it in centimetres. As you can see, the width is just over two and the length is ooh, about two and a half. So you could say it's about two by two and a half centimetres. However, you will often see measurements that claim to be exact. Beware, because even if I use a really accurate ruler, there you are, marked out to the nearest millimetre, and conclude that the size of a postage stamp is exactly 21 by 24 millimetres, which is, as it happens, the official size of a stamp according to the post office, if you look very carefully at the ruler, is that really 21 millimetres? I mean, where is 21 millimetres? Is it at this end of this rather thick line? Or is it at the beginning? Or is it in the middle? It's clearly very close to 21 millimetres, but not exactly 21. In the same way, the height is very close to 24 millimetres, but we can't be sure it's exactly 24. Which begs the question of how do we deal with these unavoidably approximate measurements, which are what we deal with every day? We have to work with something called bounds. Let's look at our stamp again. Now, according to the post office, it measures 21 millimetres by 24 millimetres. That looks to me like it's been measured to the nearest millimetre. Working back from what you know about rounding, that means it could be as short a length as 20.5 millimetres, because anything of 20.5 or above rounds up to 21. In the same way, it could be anything up to 21.4999 millimetres. Because anything up to there will round down to 21 millimetres. This brings us to the idea of bounds. At the bottom end, we've got 20.5 millimetres, which is less than or equal to the true width that we never really know. And at the top end, we've got a bound of 21.5 millimetres. Obviously, we have a strict inequality here. It has to be less than 21.5. If it was equal to 21.5, it would round up to the next one. We call the lower figure of 20.5 millimetres the lower bound, and the upper figure, guess what? The upper bound. And we can do exactly the same thing for the height of a postage stamp. It's... 23.5 millimetres is less than or equal to the true height, which is itself strictly less than 24.5 millimetres. We have our lower and upper bands. Now, in fact, the post office are a bit fussier than this about measurements, and they like to get things really very accurate indeed. So let's suppose we are told we've measured this to the nearest 0.1 millimetres. It is definitely 21 by 24 millimetres. Well, no, it's not exactly that. All we know is that it's 21.0 millimetres by 24.0 millimetres to the nearest point 0.1. But that 21.0 could be as little as 20.95 and could be as much as 21.04999999, giving us lower and upper bounds of 20.95 millimetres and 21.05 millimetres, our lower and upper bounds. And in the same way, for our height, we have lower and upper bounds of 23.95 and 24.05. In fact, the rule for working out bounds is really pretty straightforward. 
If you know a measurement to the nearest x, it could be the nearest kilogram, the nearest point one of a meter, the nearest point oh one of a liter, the measurement can vary by a half x each way. I'll give you a few examples. 450 meters to the nearest 10 meters just means 5 meters each side of that measurement. So, 445 to 455. 8.75 kilograms to the nearest 0.01 kilograms means that. 8.745 to 8.755. And 21.3 seconds to the nearest 0.2 seconds means, well, 0.1 of a second each side of our actual measurement that we have on our stopwatch between 21.2 and 21.4. What about working with bounds when you're actually doing calculations with these approximate measurements? Well, that requires a bit more thought. To show you what I mean, let us return to the sporting arena. The epic final of the year three 60 meter dash. But this particular racetrack is not measured to Olympic standards. In fact, we know that it measures 60 metres, but it's been done with a trundle wheel, so we only know that to the nearest metre. The times are being done by teachers with stopwatches. The winning time is recorded at 14.6 seconds, but only to the nearest 0.2 seconds. The question I want answered is, what is the highest possible average speed of the winner? Now, I haven't simply said, what was the average speed of the winner? Because, of course, we don't know the measurements exactly. Speed is simply distance over time. But what was the distance run? Well, all we know is that it was somewhere in between 59.5 and 60.5 metres. In the same way, the true winning time was between 14.5 and 14.7 seconds. And now you have to start thinking a bit. I am interested in the highest possible average speed. So I want this number to be as big as possible. And to make this number as big as possible, I want this number on top, the distance, to be as big as possible. But the number on the bottom, the denominator, to be as small as possible. So I take the upper bound of the distance, the lower bound of the time, do the division sum, and find that the winner completed the race at an average speed of up to 4.17 metres per second. Truly a worthy victor. So to recap, approximation and bounds. That's what today's session was all about. One, all measurements are approximate. They are never exact. Be wary of anyone who tells you they are. Number two, to calculate the bounds of a measurement is really very straightforward if you know the level of accuracy. If not, you simply have to infer it from the number you're given. If somebody says the distance is 212 metres, the only safe assumption to make is that is given to the nearest metre. And finally, to calculate with bounds requires a good bit of attention to be paid to the particular calculation concerned. That's it for this session. Please now work through the questions you have been set.